Um, thank you for that. I'll, I'll make the immediate admission that I'm a serial plagiarist. Not only have I plagiarised the Bible, I've, 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 I've plagiarised Darwin's Origin of Species as well, and a couple of others, but I hadn't realised um, that uh, Seaskirt comment is in fact plagiarism. Somebody, I went to a lecture and somebody said it, and I thought, oh, I can use that, but in fact it's one of the best known stories in, uh, told by brain scientists, so I deny, all, I deny all responsibility for it, even though it is true. Okay, so my talk is, given the question, is man just another animal? And it's a question that's often asked, and it's summarised to some extent by this statue here. And this image here is of a little brass statue, about that big, that used to sit, or sits, on the staircase of the, what was then the zoology department in the University of Edinburgh, in Scotland, where I was an undergraduate and a postgraduate, and briefly on the, a very junior member of staff. And I walked past this thing probably thousands of times, and it's still there. The only difference really is that when I was there in the 1960s, uh, it was just sitting there, and now it's screwed down. <laughs> I, th I think that tells you something about progress. Um, but um, I walked past it many times, and I, I had a vague idea what I would do about it, but I was rather incurious. And of course, in those days, we didn't have the universal key to all knowledge, which is Google. And uh, one day, uh, five, seven years ago, I thought, what, do, what does that mean, Eritus Secret Deus? Okay. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you can see it written there on one of the, um, of the open page of a book which the animal's sitting on. One of the other books in the pile, you can see, is by Darwin, and the unfortunate chimpanzee is looking with great puzzlement at a human skull. And the Eritus Secret Deus statement is actually a quotation from Genesis. Um, it's, it's a quotation from the Latin. It says, if you eat of this, and I'll translate, if you will eat of this fruit, um, then you shall be as gods, knowing of good and evil. And it's actually said to Eve uh, by the serpent, and it is secret day of scientist bonum et malum, uh, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Scientia was knowledge. The word science is actually quite a recent one. Um, and that's the real statement, that if you know, you become godlike. And that in some ways is, I think, why many people are rather um, put off by science, particularly perhaps the science of ourselves, human biology, because they have a concern that we will know, learn things about ourselves, which perhaps we would prefer not to not to not not to uh, uh, not, not not to know, and that's an old idea. Um, it was brought up, perhaps most uh, powerfully in recent history, by this chap here, who I'm sure you recognise, and that's Alfred Russell Wallace. And I'll remind you, if you didn't know, that Alfred Russell Wallace died 100 years and four days ago on uh, November the seventh, 1913. And he, of course, is the chap who wrote to Darwin from the Far East preempting Darwin's theory, and they jointly presented a paper to the Linnaean Society in 1858. It's remarkable that his last paper, 1913, was called On the Use of Flying Machines in Modern Warfare, which is an amazing thing that somebody could talk to, write to Darwin and speculate about, uh, about uh, in fact, there were drones rather than aircraft. And uh, Wallace was a great Darwinian, but he was also a spiritualist, and he very much believed that actually um, there was something which biology could not tell us about ourselves. And he was deeply religious. He wasn't particularly Christian. He had a rather unformulated view of spiritualism. And he felt, as we see it here, that man has something which is not derived from his animal progenitors, a spiritual essence or nature that can only find an explanation in the unseen universe of spirit. And he actually went to spiritual seances and things of that nature. So he took it very seriously. Darwin was very miffed by this. He didn't like it at all. And he wrote a sarcastic note to Huxley saying that at least this is not worse than the prevailing super superstitions of the country, by which, of course, he meant the Church of England. Um, so uh, it's an odd thing, and it's actually quite a deep, felt quite deeply by pe religious people who are not creationists, that somehow there is something more to us than what Darwinism can actually um, uh, explain. And Wallace wasn't, on, wasn't alone. At about the same time, here's this distinguished uh, individual here, uh, uh, there's an orangutan, the Queen Victoria was the one on the left, as you can see. Um, she went at about that time to London Zoo, and uh, she noted in her diary, when she saw the orangutan, that it was frightfully 
and painfully and disagreeably human. Okay? And that's the same kind of feeling. It's rather horrible that these creatures are like this. If they're, if they're as much like this, um, does it, does it, uh, could it be that we're being dragged down to their actual level? Now, that notion, strangely, is still alive today. Most of you know, I'm sure all of you know, that we share a great portion of our own DNA sequence with our closest relative, the chimpanzee. It's about 95%. The 98.8% figure is old and a bit too high. But it's a lot. Um, I like to show this to school kids, and I say, well, this is a picture of your biology teacher, and we always get a cheap laugh for that. But I would never dream of doing that here, of course, in this distinguished company. Um, and the question is, OK, if we share so much with chimpanzees, with gorillas, with orangutans, um, does that mean that in some senses they're just like us? Now, that seems to me a slightly odd argument, but it's certainly very much alive, both in Victoria's time and indeed today. Here's a, a, a cartoon from that extremely unfunny and now dead magazine called Punch. Um, and it's called, simply called Mr. Gorilla. And it's the ultimate horror in some senses, because here we have a gorilla dressed very grandly in evening dress, uh, walking up to a human servant who's terrified, his hair standing on end, and telling the servant to announce him to this grand dinner as Mr. Gorilla. So gorillas are able, apparently, to boss around. Um, the uh, poorer members of human society. Well, that's a joke, not a very funny one, but it actually goes further. You'll know, no doubt, again, who this individual is. This is Jane Goodall. And Jane Goodall is a remarkable woman. Um, she developed a great interest in chimpanzees and primates in general when she was a young, rather young woman. Without any formal training, she went out and spent most of her life in Africa um, studying chimpanzees in the wild. And she's done um, extraordinary things. There's no question of that. She's completely altered our, behavior, our view of chimpanzee behavior. And they're much less nice than we might imagine. Um, she, um, but she's also formed a real bond, as you can see, with her experimental animal. Now, I work on snails, so I'm not tempted to do this. <laughs> um, but uh, but <clears throat> although, actually, I rather like them, they have a charm of their own. Um, and if you, use, if you use them a lot, actually, the slime makes your hands very soft. So I'm not, I'm, not, um, I'm not neutral about them. But I never get quite as close as this, I have to say. And I have to say, also, this is a big mistake. There are many, many good reasons not to, kick a, not to kiss a chimpanzee. Um, but, uh, but Jane Goodall is passionate about chimpanzees and primates in general. And she set up about 10 years ago, a bit more now, um, a system called the Great Ape Project. And the uh, argument of the Great Ape Project, slightly to simplify it and perhaps to parody it, is to say, OK, well, we now know that chimpanzees are very, very like us in biological terms. The DNA tells us that. Therefore, if they're almost human, then they deserve some version of human rights. In other words, they're almost like us, therefore we have to treat them as if they were like us. And that indeed has been some suggestion that the Latin name of the chimpanzee, Pan, should be changed to Homo, okay, Homo paniscus. Um, now, these names are rather arbitrary, but it shows how, uh, how powerful her feeling is. And it's had a considerable effect. In many countries in Europe and in the United States, it is now illegal to carry out experiments on chimpanzees. Chimpanzee research has been banned in the lab. Uh, that includes behavioral experiments, includes, um, includes the surgical experiments, and that kind of thing. Now, one can argue about the, about the benefits or otherwise of animal experimentation, but I don't, not particularly, want to go, I don't particularly want to go there. But you can do within, within limits in Britain, very carefully controlled. You can do what you like to mice and rats, but you can't do anything to chimpanzees. So there is some suggestion then that this argument that chimpanzees are us, or we are chimpanzee, um, has had some rather profound effect on the legal system and perhaps for some people at least, on our view of ourselves. And I want to kind of explore that um, a bit. I want to ask, is it the case that, as, uh, <coughs> as Gilbert and Sullivan put it in Princess Ida, Darwinian man, though well-behaved, is nothing but a monkey shaved? Are we indeed shaved monkeys? All right. Well, let's remind it's clear that we have evolved from an ancestor shared with the chimpanzee, probably about seven million years ago. Let's just remind ourselves what the theory of evolution tells us. And I'm sure 
you don't need reminding, but many, many audiences do. Many people think that the theory of evolution somehow is a theological theory. It's much more interesting than that. It's a scientific theory, okay? Which means that it could be disproved, unlike theology, which can never by definition be disproved. Um, um, and, uh, and it's remarkably simple. It, uh, Darwin himself um, described it as, in three words, descent with modification. We can rephrase that as to say that the theory of evolution is genetics plus time. Genetics, a mechanism of passing information from one generation to the next, and time, uh, which means that the imperfections which happen as these, things, uh, as these genes are passed on, will build up, and over time you will get change. It's extremely simple. It's so simple, in fact, it could almost be physics. Um, <laughs> I, put that in for Frank, I put that in for Frank Close. Um, okay, so, but in fact it's an old idea. Uh, the idea of, uh, of descent with modification is much older than Darwin, and Darwin himself admitted this, didn't admit it, he said it. He used the analogy again and again. It's a good general rule that there are no well-known scientists in the world called Jones, but there's one here who did, um, who did remarkable work. So William Jones is an 18th century linguist, and uh, he went to Harrow School, and at Harrow School, then, and no doubt as now, all the pupils learned to speak fluent Latin Greek, and in his case, Hebrew. Um, I'm, sure nothing, I'm sure nothing has changed. Um, he also learned from his own volition all the European languages. Um, and then when he was in that young man, he went, he was sent to India as a trader, and he discovered to his great surprise that there were, he learned some Indian, Indian languages, and he discovered to his great surprise that there were similarities between some Indian languages and some of those of Europe. And it's worth reminding ourselves that in those days, the model of the origin of language was a creationist model, that language had appeared instantaneously. This is the Tower of Babel, and you will know, of course, that uh, rather foolishly, Mankind decided uh, to build a tower which would reach up to heaven so they could climb up to this tower and find out what heaven was really like. Well, God didn't like this notion at all, so <clears throat> people were building this. So he simply uh, threw down a few thunderbolts and generated languages. All the plumbers spoke English, all the electricians spoke Welsh, all the, car <laughs> all, all the carpenters spoke Chinese, and so on. And not surprisingly, the tower fell into complete disrepair. Uh, I'm not sure who spoke Polish, but um, probably, probably there weren't anybody. Okay. But that was a creationist model of language. And that was the view, of course, that was uh, felt by many people for the origin of life. That it had happened, as put forth in the, uh, in the book of Genesis, um, on October the 4th, 4004 BC, and on Thursday at 10.30 in the morning, life had come into being. Um, and people just accepted that. And Darwin actually again and again refers to language as a parallel to his theory of evolution. And of course, language is just like that. Um, now, William, jo you can hear it. I mean, if you listen to, uh, if I were to listen to, if I listened to my students when I first came to UCL 42 years ago, God help us, they all spoke frightfully, frightfully nice like this, wherever they came from. Now they all speak like this, mate, wherever they come from. And it's changing actually quite rapidly in the last couple of years. Now they're beginning to speak in a bit more of Afro-Caribbean way. So uh, I can just about understand what they're saying. I can really understand what they're actually talking about. Um, <laughs> but I'm no doubt that in a hundred years I couldn't even understand what they were saying. So language can change and change remarkably quickly. And the first person to notice that was indeed our friend William Jones. And here's a rather trivial example. Uh, these are some numbers in English, Latin, Greek, and an extinct northern Indian language called Sanskrit. It may be extinct, but it has a large literature of its own. And William Jones actually described Sanskrit as the purest and most beautiful language that he knew. And it's clear that two, duo, duo and dva, are related. Okay? Now, if somebody is related to somebody else, what do we mean? We mean, of course, that they share a common ancestor. So William Jones began to think, just a minute, maybe these languages have descended from a shared ancestor. And he drew the first of all family evolutionary trees, and here it is, um, which is the uh, descent with modification of the word for father in the Romance languages, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and the like, padre, pere, pai, um, all of which show similar, great similarities to the Latin pater, 
of 2,000 years ago or so. And 2,000 years ago, we had pater in Greek, piter in Sanskrit, fadar in Gothic, and so on. Um, and now people have gone much further, and they've actually reconstituted what the fossil words, which we no longer have any direct evidence of, might have been, and the word for father was something like pater. Okay. And they've regenerated a language which is called Pi, for Proto-Indo-European. And uh, you can go to, you can go to uh, conferences where people talk but do not throw Pi at each other. Okay. Um, and this language has been reconstituted. And we know quite a lot about it now. Um, you, if you do something rather daring and assume, and it's a big assumption, that languages change at a standard rate, um, you can begin to make a tree, not just of relatedness, but of history. And here we have the origin of some of the Indo-European languages, the split be between the Romance and Germanic languages happening about 2,000 years ago, something like that. That's between the Romance languages, Latin, um, Greek and the like, uh, uh, um, French and the like, and uh, Germanic languages, German and, of course, English, with a lot of Romance um, uh, vocabulary. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm not speaking my native language at the moment. I, I was brought up speaking Welsh, and that's split apart another uh, 5,000 years before that. And as we go further and further back, we get into deeper and deeper splits. And if you really want to wave your hand about and dance madly in the air, you can make a world tree of languages uh, which covers the whole world and actually may well go back for something like 50 or 60,000 years. The very origin of proper language with grammar and the like may have started then. Interestingly enough, and this is a paper, actually this hasn't come up all that well in the PowerPoint, but there's actually a map of Europe hidden away there somewhere. Um, what we've got is Europe, Britain is at the, uh, on the left corner there, and uh, in India is on the right corner. Uh, I don't know whether you can see any of the lines, that doesn't seem to have worked out particularly well. But what we've got is that the most ancient um, uh, 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 group of the languages, so the, the, the root of the language uh, of, of both the Indian languages and the European languages sits in Anatolia. Okay? Uh, so if you go back and you ask which is the language is most like the common ancestor of English, German, and Sanskrit, it's the Anat native Anat Anatolian language. And interestingly enough, that language is, sits absolutely in the place where farming began. And farming began in Anatolia, in the Middle East, in the Fertile Crescent, something like, like 10,000 years ago. And that led to an enormous population explosion. It led, incidentally, it's a time rather like today, actually, um, where food has suddenly became remarkably available and of remarkably poor quality. Um, people's uh, health went down very severely when they started eating porridge every day, which is what they basically did as early farmers. But the numbers expo exploded. So from the Fertile Crescent, large numbers of people were pushed out because of population pressure. Some went to the west, some to the east. And as they moved as groups, um, they passed on their native tongues to their children, to their grandchildren, to their great-grandchildren. And as that happened, um, changes built up, and we had the languages we see today. And as I said, if you really want to go mad, you can make a world tree of language, of all the languages in the world, and you get this, um, you get this uh, uh, date of some 60,000 years. So that's what evolution actually is. And of course, We've already, had the, we've already had the commercial break, and at UCL we have to have a commercial break every 20 minutes. Um, and my book, The Language of the Genes, which is now a rather old uh, volume, but still, still selling, still available in all good bookshops. Um, and uh, it turns on, the, the, the predicates on the idea of genetics as a language. And it's a simple, not a particularly original idea, which works to a degree in that the genes are indeed the individual words of an instruction manual which are altered by error, by mutation, um, as, uh, as, uh, as, we, as time moves on. And we can draw family trees which relate different creatures to each other. Or we can do it, for example, to the primates, to modern humans, the species to which many of us claim to belong. Um, and you can see that modern humans and chimpanzees split apart. They had a common ancestor about seven million years ago. Neanderthals were extinct, but they're, they're much closer. Gorillas have split apart from the common ancestor of uh, the human chimp, uh, a duo about eight million years ago. And as we go all the way back to 80 or so million years ago, we get to our distant relatives like the tree shrews and the flying lemurs, all of which are somewhat related to us. And that process is exactly the process which William Jones used um, to disentangle the origin of language. And now it's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, um, 
um, uh, anatomy. Um, it's, uh, it's DNA, reading DNA from end to end just completes the process which the anatomist Vesalius did in the start of the 15th century when he cut open the human heart and found that it had four chambers and not three, as, been, it had, as had been uh, assumed for 1,500 years before. Now, we've gone much further than that. We've cut, cut open the human genome and we found that it's got 3,000 million DNA base pairs. Rather surprisingly, it's got a small number of genes, about 23,000 of them, uh, rather fewer than tomatoes have, and I have no explanation of that fact, but it is there. But we can use um, that statement to make these family trees. And we can begin to ask the question, okay, well, how similar are we at the genetic level to creatures like chimpanzees? How have we changed? Why have we changed? And what, if anything, t does that tell us about the question that posed in the title of this talk, is man just another animal? Well, here is our relative, the chimpanzee. Big teeth, big muscles, and lots of hair, all right? And I'll let you into the secret, which is the big surprise of the comparative analysis of human and chimp, chimp genomes, which is now under full steam. And of course, you can sequence a human genome in three or four hours, or a chimp genome in three or four hours, is that it's a story of loss. Humans have lost an enormous amount of, of talents, number, number of talents, since the split from our common ancestor with the chimpanzee seven million years ago. They're hairy. Chimpanzees are very hairy, okay? Well, I can tell you, rather surprisingly, you may well know, that you're just as hairy as the average chimpanzee. Look at the back of your hand, and you will see that there are lots of hairs on it. Now, they're not big, thick, and matted hairs, but if you count the number of hair follicles, which we have versus chimps have, um, then uh, we have the same numbers of follicles, but our hairs are, are feeble in comparison. Okay. Same is true of teeth. Uh, we have incisor teeth, but nothing like that. Um, may it be there was a, just a single mutation, a single error, a single change, which made us bald. Some of us, I can see, balder than others, but, um, uh, and that, that, that's hinted at by these charming creatures here, which are on the left a Mexican hairless dog, which has got a mutation in the keratin gene, the gene which makes the substance of hair, which means it's got hair follicles but no hair. Um, and then there's even more repellent cat uh, called the Sphinx hairless cat. And it's rather interesting, if you look at them, both of them have a rather charming sort of hair, you know, a sort of punk haircut on the top of their heads. So it may well be that this is indeed um, something to do um, with uh, a loss of information in, this, in our line compared to chimpanzees. But it goes much further than that. We saw a picture of Jane Goodall cuddling a chimpanzee. Okay. One of the reasons not to do that is suggested by these headlines from recent American newspapers. Um, chimp shot after vicious attack on woman. U.S. student mauled by chimps in critical condition. And if you pick up a chimpanzee, which I've actually done, a baby chimpanzee in London Zoo, it is a positively frightening experience. Uh, the animal was not at all aggressive. It just wrapped its arms around me, and I couldn't get him off. Um, and, and that's because we have lost an enormous amount of our muscular ability. And you can see that in this rather boring slide here, but I'll talk your way through it. This is what geneticists do all day. They read the four letter, the four letter words, or the three letter words in a four letter envelope uh, alphabet of DNA, G, G, A, C, C, T, 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 blah, blah, blah. And this is um, a section of the muscle uh, genes which, are called, which is called myosin. And myosin is one of the muscles, one of the elements of muscles, it's a bit like a rack and pinion system, um, and they slide past each other, myosin and actin, and this is one of them. Now, if you look at a number of primates at the top there, a position number 39, is it, or 38, uh, you will see that every single one of them has got the letters C and A. Yeah, C and A, okay? Chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutan, pigtail macaque, misspelt woolly monkey, they're all the same, okay? Humans don't have it. Those two letters are missing. Um, and humans from all over the world, Spain, Iceland, Japan, and Russia, they simply don't have those two letters. And what that has done is to remove a large quantity, quantity of our muscular strength. And that's particularly the case, you can see that, for example, in jaw muscles. If a chimpanzee bites you, it'll bite your hand off, more than likely. Um, and that's manifest in the attachment 
and that is the attachment points where jaw muscles are, uh, are held on the skull. Now, if you m move your jaw up and down, you can feel that your jaw muscles are actually attached about here. And here we've got at the right there, we have a human, the bottom right, we have a human skull. And the red mark is the attachment level, the attachment uh, uh, point for the human jaw muscles. Okay? And it's, it's relatively limited. But if we compare that with our relatives, gorillas in the middle and macaques on the left, you'll see that the red section is far, far greater. And indeed, that in both macaques and gorillas, there are crests on the skull, which give even more surface area for the muscles to attach. And that's because these creatures have got far, far more powerful muscles in the jaw than we do. Well, why is that? Well, it's pretty obvious that they have to chew a lot, okay? Humans in this uh, McDonaldized um, universe of ours spend about three quarters of an hour chewing every day. Chimpanzees spend about ten hours a day chewing. Um, and that's uh, because of their diet. Here we have the chimpanzee diet. Lots and lots of leafy greens, uh, quite a lot of purplish fruit there, um, seeds, pine bark and insects, pretty solid stuff. They missed it. This comes from a school's um, uh, uh, website. And they missed off a little red bit, which is chimpanzees, because they like eating their enemies as well. But that's another story. Um, and you compare that with the standard, well, I was going to say the standard human diet, um, the standard American diet, which I have to say is not very, is not very different from, from the uh, poor people's British diet, diet in Britain. And you'll see in that uh, enormous segment there of bread, pasta, potatoes, and the like. Huge amounts of st soft, starchy food, almost no dark leafy greens, a little bit of fruit, and then a whole pile of meat, and then a few vegetables and oils and that kind of stuff. Um, and so what we eat tends to be softer and mushier than what chimpanzees eat. How does it get to be softer and mushier? Well, actually, it's remarkably simple. It does it by cooking. And it's one of the most remarkable things about ourselves as a species which uh, is really unique, genuine is unique, that we are the only animal that's ever existed in history that cannot digest its own food. If you decide to go on a diet which involves eating only raw food, you will lose weight. It's guaranteed. Unlike most diets, it, you will lose weight. I have to say, when I say raw food, I mean raw food. I don't mean pickled food. I don't mean minced food. I don't mean feed the food that's warmed up. I mean a dead chicken with uh, feathers on it and a potato, okay? And you can eat dead chicken and potato and, or, dead f or fish or carrots or anything you like or nuts. You can eat ad libitum until you're blue in the face or probably more likely green in the face. Um, and within six months, you will die of starvation. So we cannot live on raw food. We, in fact, depend on an external stomach. And that external stomach kind of depends where, it, you, where, where you live. Um, in Glasgow, it's the deep fat fryer. Um, okay. In, um, in, um, in, 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 uh, in the States, it's a barbecue. Uh, in my kitchen, I'm ashamed to say, it's quite often a microwave. But you have to pre-digest your food before you can eat it. And that goes back a long way. Cooking um, goes back far, far earlier than modern humans. The ability to cook and the fact that we have fires, and they've been found inside caves a long way from the entrance, so they're not just lightning fires, uh, as much as half a million years ago, that may well be the propelled us, what propelled us into our evolutionary path, which has been so different from the chimpanzee um, evolutionary path. And so we are the, we are the, the, uh, we are the, the ape, that can, we are the dyspeptic ape, the ape that cannot digest its food. We blanch bake, boil, braise, and sometimes burn, but we can't do it without external help. And you can see the power of that by looking at the, um, at the, um, oh God, again, I'm not the greatest um, image there, but there, there we have a chimpanzee with its gut there on the left, and a human of about the same dimensions with its gut on the right. And in terms of absorptive area in the gut, chimpanzees have got about three or four times as much as we have. And they need that, and they have much more powerful enzymes than we do. We've lost many of our digestive enzymes that allow us to break down uh, raw meat, let's say. Um, they need that because they can't cook their food. Interestingly enough, if you feed pet chimpanzees on cooked food, they become obese, just the same as we do. Okay? So maybe the raw food diet has got a certain amount to, uh, to uh, commend it. So that's another way in which we've lost our, um, our abilities compared to the ability that must have been held by the common ancestor of ourselves and chimpanzees some seven million 
years ago. But the news is not good, it goes even further. Uh, it goes to the murky world of sex. Um, here we have um, Michelangelo's David. Check out his thumb. Okay. <clears throat> Um, it's clear that Michelangelo's David is not a particularly realistic image of a gentleman, but of course in Greek statuary it was set to purity and the like to, uh, to, have, a particular, to have small, you know, for a man to have a small penis. Um, so that overstates the um, feebleness of the human penis and the human testicles. If you look at this rather gloomy looking chimp on the right, I don't quite say, see why he's looking so depressed. He has uh, two rather prominent features which are considerably more impressive than us, those of our own, okay? And in fact, chimpanzees have got testes far greater than ours and produce far, far more sperm than we do. But he goes further than that. Here's a chimpanzee making, um, uh, oh, <laughs> this is a, uh, things are getting worse, rapid evolution going on. The human sperm count is going down at a tremendous rate, at least in France. Um, <clears throat> I tried to, they aren't my teaspoons. I tried to find them, but I couldn't find them. Um, but the, so the sp our sperm count is uh, probably a quarter or a fifth that of a chimpanzee. Okay. But it's not just the sperm that's feeble, it's the delivery system. Here's a chimpanzee demonstrating its masculinity. Um, you can see fairly well endowed there, obviously in rather bad temper for one reason or another. Uh, chimpanzees have uh, rather large genitalia. But, quite unexpectedly, chimpanzees and all our relatives, unlike ourselves, have spines on the penis. Okay? And those spines, which are quite, um, quite um, uh, solid looking things, are used in what we call mate guarding. In other words, once the chimpanzee has mated with a female, he wants to ensure that the female stays in place until his own personal sperm has had a chance to impregnate her, and so the spines make it very difficult for her to get away. Our cats have them too, which is why cats make this horrible row when they're mating in your garden um, late at night. Okay, and it's a, it's a striking thing that we've lost it. Here we have um, some ex some um, an experiment done with uh, with castrated galagos, which are monkeys, ditto with mice. Normal mi mice have big have big whiskers and big uh, spines on the penis. Uh, castrated mice and Monkeys have um, no spines on the penis, give, give them testosterone, they grow back again. Now, if you look in humans, uh, if you look at a thing called the androgen receptor, the androgen is the male sex hormone, we have a missing androgen receptor compared to nearly all or many other mammals. So that it's the presence of the androgen receptor that picks up some testosterone from the bloodstream and that persuades these spines to grow. And we don't have that receptor. You'll see at the top the chimps, macaques, and mice have got it, the red triangle in the box, but we simple don't, simply don't. And we don't have spines um, as well. So that too is really quite startling. Okay. So, well, we can go further than that. I don't want to keep. I want, don't want to depress you all that much further, except to show you this slide, which is really is quite startling. What this is is a diagram of the human genome, all the human DNA, three thousand million letters, and of all the all the um, all the uh, chimpanzee DNA uh, put together. And what we've got at the top there is a, a map of human chromosomes, uh, one to twenty-two plus X and Y, and the blue lines. On the, on the human chromosome, which you can see, mark places where DNA is missing in our own genome compared to that of the chimp. And you can see there are many, many, many places where that's true. And some of those deletions, as we call them, losses of DNA information, involve something like 120,000 uh, DNA bases. Um, and many, more, many of them, are much, many of them are, much, are smaller, but there are lots of them. So we've lost an enormous amount of information compared to, compared to, uh, to chimpanzees. So it's not just the penis spines, it's not just the, the indigestion, it's everything. So that's very, very strange. We like to think of ourselves, perhaps, as being at the summit of creation, but in terms of, of molecular genetics, it's clear that we are really failed chimpanzees. We are really diminished chimpanzees. And that's odd. So what's going on? Well, um, what's clearly going on is that we've changed the way we evolve. Now, hu modern humans appeared, people argue about it endlessly, but modern humans appeared on Earth something like 150 200, uh, to 200,000 years ago, clearly in Africa. We are an African species. Everybody in this room is an African. Some of us perhaps more African than others, but we are an African primate. And we got out of Africa um, something like, and again, endless boring arguments go on about this, 120,000 years ago, and didn't get very far. 
Um, but then finally we began to move and we got to civilization or, or, uh, or Britain about 40,000 years ago. Um, strangely enough, we didn't get to the New World, to the Americas, until 21,000 years ago. And they finally walked across what was then the Bering Land Bridge before the ice melted and it became the, it be, became the Bering Strait. And we filmed the New World within about two or 3,000 years. So we're an Arabist kind of species. Okay. Now, uh, what's now been done, and it's now very much underway, is a thing which was called the Thousand Genome Project. That's now finished. We've now got the 10,000 Genome Project, which is to sequence the DNA of 10,000 people from across the globe. And uh, an awful lot of interesting stuff is coming out, which I'm not going to talk about in detail. But there's one aspect of ourselves which makes us immediately distinct from that of our relatives. We can use the DNA to draw a family tree of humankind. And it's worth remembering that in the 1960s, I hate to say it, when people began to look objectively at the differences between, let's say, Africans and Europeans, um, there was a strong expectation, a semi-scientific expectation, that Africans and Europeans, let's say, or the Chinese and, and, uh, and Papua New Guineans, would be biologically quite distinct from each other. And that wasn't a, you know, a stupid thing to think, because it is frankly clear that Africans and Europeans, or Chinese and, and Native Americans, look fairly different from one another. But that wasn't true at all. I vivid memories in the early days of protein variation when we were working on this, and many other people were working on it, being quite astonished to find how similar, how simple, uh, how small the genetic differentiation, di differentiation of humans from different places actually was. We're the most boring primate of all uh, across the globe at the genetic level. And you can see that in this family tree here. This is a family tree of one particular kind of DNA, which you don't have to bother ourselves about in detail, but what we've got here are chimps, bonobos, which are pygmy chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, all on the same family tree, um, and the length of the, each line is a statement of how distinct the animal, or human, uh, which is represented by that line, is from its closest and more distant relatives. And it's immediately obvious that if you look at humans, we're all the same. Okay, that, 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 that group of red lines includes people from Africa, from France, from Papua New Guinea, from China, Native Americans, people from the South Seas, people from Finland, and wherever you go, really, we're brothers and sisters under the skin. Um, and so we have not changed physically scarcely at all as we filled the world. If you look at the chimpanzees, let's say, uh, the picture is totally different. Um, uh, two groups of chimpanzees living a couple of hundred yards apart, uh, uh, a couple of hundred miles apart, are more genetically distinct from each other than our two uh, very distinct human populations. Let's say the most advanced human race, which is, of course, the French. Um, compare them to somebody like, let's say, let's say whatever you like, Native Americans. Um, there is almost no difference between them. Okay? So we have not changed in our uh, biology since we began. So what's happened? Well, clearly, something um, which has got nothing to do with biology has happened. Um, and it's got to do with this organ here, which has definitely got something to do with biology, uh, which is the brain. And the human brain has shown a quite unprecedented degree of expansion. The human brain, or the human cortex, which is the thinking bit of the brain, is five times bigger in terms of body mass than is the, uh, that of the chimpanzee. And indeed, if you look at a newborn baby, more than half of all its metabolic energy goes into its brain. Okay? Um, and indeed, even with adults, a great proportion, more of their metabolic energy goes into their brain when they're in a resting state than into any other organ. So the brain is expensive. And it may well be is that cooking gave us the brain. Uh, because cooking gave us tons and tons of cheap and available protein and, and energy foods uh, which al allows the brain to grow. Um, chimpanzee brains simply can't afford to get that big because the extent to which they can soak up nutrition is so much less. So we have big brains with lots of nerve cells and lots of connections within them. Um, they've got big, bigger and bigger over time. Um, in fact, strangely enough, our, our own brains are a little bit smaller than Neanderthals, but Neanderthals were bigger and more brutal creatures than we are. And it's continued to go up and up and up. Since the uh, human chimp common ancestor, the human brain has, has gone up in size, but probably about four, about five or six times. And various events have taken place, and I'll, I'll talk about one of them in a moment. If you count the number of nerve cells, it's actually rather interesting too. If you compare ourselves 
with chimpanzees, we have twice as many nerve cells, but in fact they're much, much more connected to each other. Whales have got quite a lot of nerve cells in the brain, but whales are big animals. Most of those nerve cells are saying, you know, fla flap your flippers now, mate. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not thinking about, uh, they're not thinking about, uh, about theology. Uh, dogs, you will notice, are very stupid, okay? <laughs> and that's what makes them into good pets. Pets are stupid. That's why cats are not such good pets as dogs, because cats are in control of us, and we're in control of dogs. Um, but most pets lose, uh, lose, lose their brains. Uh, wolves have got twice as many nerve cells as dogs. But those figures understate the extent of complexity of the human brain, because now we can count the numbers of connections in brains. And the number of connections from one nerve cell to another in the human brain is several times that of a chimpanzee. So we have very, very complicated brains. And of course, what brains do is that they give you all kinds of abilities that other animals don't have. And the greatest ability of all is that which was studied by William Jones, which is language. Okay? And if you ask me what the most futile piece of biological research in the last 50 years has been, and that I can tell you there is a lot of competition, uh, <laughs> the most futile has been the endless attempt to teach chimpanzees to speak. Um, now, that's how many people are trying to do that. It's, they, they can't formulate words because they haven't got the right kind of uh, hyoid bone at the back of the, bottom, back of the mouth. So they can't make complicated words, but people have tried to teach them sign language. They're trying to use um, plastic cutout shapes so they can put them together. And the best they can ever get is dirty potty, really. I mean, they, they put two shapes together, and, but they're not really saying anything at all. So chimpanzees are really pretty damn dim when you think about it. The other interesting thing about chimpanzees is that they ape, but they don't teach. If you, you've seen, no doubt, on David Attenborough programs, chimpanzees, um, uh, let's say, bashing open a nut with a stone, or elsewhere in Africa using a twig to put it into an ant's nest and lick off the, uh, lick off the animals, uh, lick, lick off the food. And they do that, and you know, well done chimpanzee. But what's interesting is that they don't teach their offspring to do it. Their offspring might be there, looking at their mummy and daddy bashing a nut with a stone, but, the mum, but their parents don't change their behavior when their offspring is there. They don't say, oh, you look, you pick up this stone, you put this thing there, and you bash it. They just don't do that. It's a simple matter of aping each other rather than uh, the pedagogy which we're all so um, expert at in our own species. Okay. And the, one of the reasons we teach, of course, one of the ways we teach <coughs> is by turning cheese sandwiches into hot air, which is what I'm doing at the moment, uh, by talking. And when you speak, to give a grossly oversimplified uh, explanation <coughs> of speech, a part of the brain on the left cortex, called Broca's area, breaks into action. And uh, there is, this is a bit of molecular phrenology, and when we begin to talk about futile biological research, I'd better change the subject. But um, uh, if you do brain scans of people who can speak normally, um, a little bit on the, of the left side of the brain, Broca's area, begins to become very active. Okay? In fact, much more of the brain becomes active. But this is clearly important because if somebody has a stroke that, damage, that damages Broca's area, they tend to lose the ability to speak. Well, about 10 years ago, a bit more than that now, a family was found in West London with what's called verbal dyspraxia. And verbal dyspraxia, is, there are many speech defects, some of which have quite a strong genetic component, but this one's really particularly interesting because these kids on, any, on other tests of IQ, numbers and shapes and puzzles and that kind of stuff, are of normal intelligence. They find it almost impossible to deal with language. And what they find particularly difficult to deal with is not vocabulary, but grammar. Okay. Um, and in some ways, that's a biological tale. You could write, to, uh, genetics is the language, of, uh, g g g genetics is, the, is, is a language, evolution is the grammar of that language. So these kids can't deal with grammar. For them, the cat sat on the mat is effectively indistinguishable from the mat sat on the cat, which is kind of bad news for the cat, I guess. Um, but if you scan their brains, you can see, I think, there that there's chaotic activation of the, uh, the centres uh, center all over the brain. And this is quite strongly genetic. Now, this is a gross, this has been much publicized and talked about the gene for speech, which is far, far too simple way of putting it, but it's got something to do with speech. And it's a gene that's called FOXP2. And one of the baffling things, one of the many baffling things in, in genetics, and it really is baffling, is that genes which in fruit flies say, this is called FOX, FOX stands for forkhead box, and forkhead is simply an abnormality in the, in the um, antennae of, the, of a fruit fly. 
for some reason, it has something to do with speech in humans. Don't ask me what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. But FOXP2 is the gene involved, and it's damaged, okay? Uh, it makes a protein like this, which is involved in binding um, uh, nerve transmission between synapses in the brain. Um, and uh, it's, you can make a family tree of it, okay? Now, you can make family trees, as I said, by looking at the similarity of DNA between different species. And there are two kinds, again, to oversimplify, there are two kinds of changes in DNA. There are those which are sometimes called silent changes. In other words, they change the DNA code, but they don't change the protein like, as they, like the muscle one did. They simply they, they, they have rather little effect on the protein level. And they're shown as blue lines here. But there are others which do change the DNA code to, that makes a protein. So they change the building blocks of the body itself. And I think you can see that at first glance, uh, the FOXP2 uh, family tree shows humans, chimps, gorillas, orangs, and so on, all very similar to each other. Except that, if you look a bit more carefully, you'll see that there are two mutations in FOXP2 which do change the structure, the protein structure, of this substance in humans and not in chimpanzees. And to oversimplify it, that might be something to do with what gave us our unique ability to, to speak. No other creature can speak. They can make particular sounds, but they're not what we call transitive. They can't put different sounds together to make sentences. Okay. So we can speak. And in FOXP2 is remarkable stuff. It turns out chimps are, are useless at it. It turns out that birds that don't sing uh, have very inactive FOXP2s. But birds like parrots that can copy human language have really active FOXP2s. Whether they, whether they can un understand what they're saying when they're saying pretty poly, science is not yet ready to disclose. But there's something going on there. It definitely has something to do with, um, with, uh, with speech. One of the slight embarrassments is that Neanderthals um, uh, have the same version of FOXP2 as we do. And Neanderthals nominally went extinct or originated long before human language is thought to have uh, thought to have. Um, or to originate it. But if you look in more detail at human FOXP2, and at many, many of the changes in the enormous piece of DNA involved, little tiny changes, um, in fact, there are lots and lots of minor changes in humans which are not present in Neanderthals. So it suggests that actually FOXP2 in humans has evolved very actively since they split with Neanderthals, and that uh, family tree only tells you part of the story. So, you know, that, that really is what makes us, to some extent, what we are, is the ability to speak. And once you've got now, the ability to speak, in some ways, you've got, in, in many ways, you've got a new kind of genetics. Because genetics is a way of passing on information from one generation to the next. And so, of course, is language. Okay? Except that, uniquely, language does, doesn't pass from parents to children to grandchildren. It passes horizontally as well. So that we, I can spread my words around this audience in a way I simply uh, would be far too tired to spread my genes around this audience, okay? <laughs> it simply wouldn't be feasible. So you've got this astonishingly powerful method of changing the way we think, which stands outside genetics. And what that does in some ways is to move us into a completely new evolutionary universe. It makes us unique. And uh, bi uh, bi evolutionary biology is rather bad at dealing with unique attributes, because evolution is overwhelmingly a comparative science. Darwin constantly compared different creatures. All those family trees turn on the comparison of the DNA sequence of chimps and humans and anything else you like. Um, and uh, if you can't compare, it's very hard to know what's going on. And you can illustrate that difficulty with language. I can illustrate it actually with a joke that my father told me many years ago. Um, set in the town where I went to primary school in Aberystwyth in West Wales and I went to a Welsh-speaking primary school and in Aberystwyth in the 1950s um, when I was there it was very much a Welsh-speaking town uh, which it is as long as there are English people in the room um, <laughs> even today but it was very much Welsh-speaking and the tale my father told me turned on the, uh, found on, on the appearance of Aberystwyth's first Chinese restaurant. And Aberystwyth, strangely enough, has got some rather nice restaurants in it now, including a couple of good Chinese restaurants. But in 1950, this was quite unprecedented. A Chinese restaurant opens up in Aberystwyth. So the cu a customer goes into the restaurant and is quite astonished to be served very nice Chinese food by a very polite and clearly Chinese waiter who speaks perfect Welsh. Well, the customer is astonished by this, so he beckons over the owner and asks him, in Welsh of course, and I will translate for you, he says, well boy, where did you get this amazing fellow? 
a Chinese person who can speak Welsh. And the owner looked alarmed, and he said, oh, keep your voice down, Boyle. He thinks he's learned English. <laughs> and that actually is a perfect illustration of the importance of the comparative method. Because, of course, to a Chinese native speaker, Welsh and English are dialects of a language called Indo-European. And he or she would be completely correct in that statement. To a Welsh or an English speaker, the various Chinese mainland languages, and there are several of them, Hakka and the like, um, they're, simple, they're all the same. But they're not. They're mutually incomprehensible. Okay. Now, because we've got all the languages of the world that we have, and the fossils of language in the books and so on, which are in Latin or in Sanskrit, we can disentangle that. We can make a family tree of language. We can work out how they're related to each other, um, where they spread, the way they fit together, all those kinds of things we can do. Okay? And that's what William Jones did, and that's what the Proto-Indo-European people did in much more detail. But let's imagine sometime in probably not too distant future when there's only one word or only one language in the world. Um, I don't think it's going to be Welsh, unfortunately. Um, it might well be Chinese, but for the sake of argument, let's make it English. And uh, let's simplify matters even further by, first of all, burning all the books. It's going to happen anyway. And secondly, reformat reformatting all the computers every 10 years so you can't read what happened uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and that's already happened too. So we've got one world language, and we all speak the same language. We would have no idea, we could have no idea, how that language had emerged. When it emerged, where it emerged, how it emerged, how it had travelled across the globe, how old it was, the way its grammar worked, the way its vocabulary worked, would be a complete mystery to us. It could not be penetrated because there's no standard of comparison. Now, we are the only spe species that have language proper, but of course, we are, at least as far as we can tell, the only species that has many other attributes too. We are the only species, as far as we can tell, that has a sense of history, a sense of the future, perhaps the distant future to come, in terms of, let's say, global warming. We're the only species um, that finds it necessary to be concerned by people who are not our close relatives. We're worried about hurricanes in the in the in the in the in the in the, far, in the far east and the like. And all the we have religion. As far as we can tell, no other creature has any sense of spirituality. And in that sense, I suppose Alfred Russell Wallace um, was 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 right. But um, once we then face the problem, because these are unique to ourselves, all these attributes, they are not open to, to investigation by evolutionary biologists or perhaps by biologists at all, because they have no standard of comparison. So that the fear which, is, which was put out so often, the concern that's been put out so often, it was put out by Queen Victoria when she saw Jenny the orangutan, to me is quite wrong. Many of the people who don't like and who didn't like Darwin's theory of evolution, didn't like it and feared it because it made them feel less human than they had thought they were. I find exactly the opposite. The theory of evolution makes me feel far, far more human than I ever imagined I could be. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.